Well, good morning to all of you and to welcome and welcome to Sakar. You see, we are going to start uh, on a new journey into Savitri. And the focus, the really the direction of the journey is to see Savitri from the angle of gods and goddesses. A few months back when I thought of this subject, I did not know then that Savitri is really quite steeped with gods and goddesses. In the beginning we do not realize how much of this book stands on the truths of gods and goddesses. And when you start reading it from this angle, one quite recollects the Vedas, Vedas which are full of gods and goddesses, not goddesses as much as gods. And I was quite amazed to see that Sri Aurobindo recaptures the Vedic atmosphere. That means he is constantly invoking the gods and the goddesses. It doesn't seem to be, but if you go deeper, you will see it is so. In fact, it is interesting to see that the very genesis of Savitri, the story of Savitri, points us to gods and goddesses. Most of you who are already introduced to Savitri would know that the story was told by a Rishi called Rishi Markandeya to the eldest brother of the Pandavas, the Yudhishthira. But the interesting thing is, who was Rishi Markandeya himself? And there begins the story of the gods and goddesses. Markandeya's, Markandeya's parents, Mrikandu and Maradvati, they were devotees of Shiva and Vishnu. And very similar to the story of Savitri, they too did not have an issue. So the father does penance, like Ashwapati, maybe not that long, and prays to Lord Shiva to grant him a son. And so after his tapasya, Lord Shiva grants him a son, but on one condition. He says, do you want a son, an ordinary son who will live a long, long life? Or a brilliant one who will live only 16 years? The choice obviously falls on the short life of 16 years. There. So there he says, I will choose a brilliant man, a brilliant child, a boy, who would live only 16 years. And so this son who was named the Makandeya, he lives 16 years and when the time comes, He knows his time has come. 
and his praying at the linga of Shiva. As usual, when the time comes, you know all of us in Indian stories, mythology, Yama sends his assistants to get the soul of Markandeya. And these agents of Yama, they come to take away Markandeya, but as he's sitting with the linga of, of Shiva, they cannot touch him. Yama says, I will go myself and get the soul of Markandeya. When Yama comes, Markandeya is really embracing the linga, the Shiva linga. And so when Yama puts his lasso, wanting to be around the neck of Markandeya, it falls around the Shiva linga. So obviously there's a tussle and Shiva gets angry that Yama has come to capture him. And so there appears Lord Shiva and there ensues a battle and Lord Shiva kills Yama. And then obviously the gods and goddesses they come and plead with Shiva saying if Yama is dead, if he is killed, then this entire creation would be in topsy-turvy. So please revive him. So Lord Shiva sees the argument, the logic and he says, all right, I'll revive him, but on one condition, that he dare not touch Markandeya ever. And so Lord Yama says, all right, I will not come back to for Markandeya. So Markandeya is called the Chiranjeevi, the immortal Rishi. I mean, those of you who know the story of Savitri, you will see already the pattern is established. So he is the Chiranjeevi, one who is deathless. And thereafter, Chiranjeevi, Markandeya, lives forever. And the most interesting thing is, we have a Purana called Markandeya Purana. And one of the most important things is that it is he who has written the Devi Mahatmya, the Chende part, and what Dipshika also sang about Durga. So he has written about the Durga Saptashati, and which have become really living tradition of the country. So you see this whole thing is about gods, about Durga, all the stotras that are there, that are Bengal and India sings them every year in all the pujas. And then there's the element of immortality. You know what Savitri is seeking is nothing but immortality. And then there's the death of Yama, the same theme of Savitri. So almost you see Savitri is already foretold in the story of Markande himself. Death of Yama, immortality about gods and goddesses. So I wonder if Shobhinda had not chosen this Savitri, not only because of the story Savitri, but also on what is it based? The genesis of Savitri has this entire features of Savitri itself. So the three things that are emphatic, uh, emph that, that, that there's an emphasis on, gods and goddesses, because you know Shiva and Vishnu and, and the Durgas, Totras, Yama's death and immortality and physical immortality, please remember. And if you know, these are precisely the three basic lines of Savitri. Nothing else and nothing more than these three. So there we see 
Shurabindo Savitri is very directly connected with the story of Markandeya, with the life of Markandeya, with the story of Markandeya. And that takes us back where? To the Vedas. And then as we read further, we almost begin to think, is it a Vedic Rishi who has come back as Sri Aurobindo and, and written the Savitri? I mean, when I started reading this and looking into this, I was given to understand there are about 1,000 references to the word God. God, God's plural apostrophe S. And now that you are aware of it, you open almost every third page or every second page, random you can open and you will see the word God. So I was amazed to see why is it that Shobindo is constantly speaking about gods and goddesses, not even as the as a deity, as a personality of a goddesses or even the personality of God, but even to the reference of God, God, God-like, God's, Godhead, this is obviously to invoke the same presence of the Vedas. What did they do? Why did the Vedas invoke the gods and goddesses so much? Obviously, as Shravinda himself has told us, that the entire purpose of the Vedas was to give us a live link, a con not only live, a live link, a constant link between man and God. So it is not just for fun, they said, okay, you worship to Indra, worship Agni, worship Vayu, when you get up in the morning, worship Surya Dev. Their whole purpose was to connect you with every moment of your life. And now when you read Savitri, he is constantly, Sri is constantly bringing in the presence of the Godhead. And there you see, it's not necessarily that he is being religious or Vedic religious to bring in particular gods, which are also there, who are also there, we will see at the end of the day, that there are Godheads, but the very question of the Godhead, Godhead is the Godhood. Godhood is the presence, the characteristics of the gods. So when he is bringing this presence of the gods, then the whole of Savitri, as the mother would herself tell us, it becomes mantric. Mantric in the sense, evocative, invocative. That all that you touch and read, all the lines that you read, are constantly reminding you of the Godhead. So you can imagine what is Savitri in itself. It's a constant invocation to the Divine. So you can read any line and you'll see that presence. That is the beauty of this book. It is not a story. As the mother gave us in a single line, Savitri is the mantra for the transformation of the earth. So now we begin to see, you see normally we do understand, we do read these lines but when you go deeper into Savitri you understand the meaning. So then we come back to understand that this question of writing Savitri for Sri was not only what he said and I sent in my, to my, in my consciousness, but what kind of an ascent was it? Is it an ascent from the lower physical, lower vital and all that? No, it was an ascent from great heights of the superconscious towards the supermind. So there's a constant ascent of a higher consciousness. It is not from the subconscious, inconscient towards the superconscious. 
So therefore we, the moment we plunge into Savitri, take any line, you will already see that vibration of the mantra, of that higher consciousness. So let us not take gods in this sense that there are names, Vedic names of gods. In fact, I have brought a definition given by Sri Aurobindo himself, very beautiful, very clear. He says, the dynamic aspect of the divine is the supreme Brahman, not the gods. Try to remember, and by the way, let me introduce a little bit and I'll take a little digression. Yeah, these sessions, as I've written on the notice board, is only a part one. Because uh, we are going to get into Savitri vis-a-vis -vis the Life Divine and see that all the symbolism, the gods and goddesses and the concepts, etc. that are given in Savitri will be juxtaposed against Sri Aurobindo's philosophy. So every time I will be giving you a, a passage from Savitri based on or referring to the gods and goddesses and then take you back into the philosophy. So, it's just to tell you that those of you who are, who are interested in seeing this philosophical, religio-philosophical aspect of Savitri, that would be my trend. So, there I'll be going a bit deeper into most of these symbols and, and concepts. So, it's in that line, when you're speaking about gods, the first thing I thought is to understand, who are the gods? So Sri in, in one of his books he says, the dynamic aspect of the divine is the supreme Brahman, not the gods. And there you are, already in, 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 a trouble, in trouble. We have the three words, divine, supreme Brahman and gods. In normal parlance, Brahman, Supreme, Gods, they're all one. For us, we don't make much of a distinction. But then you see, there is a, a distinction. First, he says, it's a Supreme. And there is one Supreme in, in the philosophy, which I'll take up later in our PPT. That one Supreme is the Tat. T-A-T, Tat. And that Supreme is static, unmanifest, creation has not yet begun. So that is called the Supreme, what Sri Aurobindo would call the Divine, not Supreme, the, div uh, the Divine. And that static Divine, when He begins the manifestation, when it starts creating, manifesting. So that is called this dynamic aspect. And that dynamic aspect, Sri Aurobindo calls as the Supreme Brahman. And now we see for the first time, Sri Aurobindo uses an Indian terminology, Brahman. Normally he won't use it. He will clarify it later, but let me stick to the uh, definition here. So he says, the Tat is there, the dynamic aspect of this Tat is called the Supreme Brahman. Or in other terms, the same Supreme Brahman is called the Sat Chit Ananda. So either you call it the Brahman or the Sat Chit Ananda, who is the dynamic aspect. So gods are not yet coming into the picture at all. Dynamism is Brahman. Then it says, the gods are personalities and powers of the dynamic divine. That's the third level. The Tat, the Brahman, and then these gods, about whom we are going to speak, so they form the powers and personalities. So you see, there is in this creation a kind of a decentralization, if I can use the word. Normally, in Indian mythology, we say, oh, Brahman created, or Satchitananda created, or God created. Here in Sri Aurobindo, gods are not the creators. 
it is Brahman. But Brahman creates through his agents, agencies. And these agents are the gods. So all the names of the gods, be it Greek or African or Chinese or Indian, they are all only agents of creation, not the creators themselves. So there is only one power, Supreme Brahman, who creates. That is the definition of the gods. So, I mean, not yet the full definition, but I am slowly introducing you to the concept. And then there comes the question of a very, very remarkable sentence that Shravanda gives us. You see, uh, in fact, I wanted to give you, lest you think that I am talking only philosophy. I brought a, a line here, um, a passage. You see, uh, when I talked, uh, told you about uh, Markandeya, and Yama being destroyed by Shiva, and I said, there's a similar passage in Savitri, all of you know that. You know, the one that I'm referring to in Book 10, Canto 4. The famous passage where Savitri and, and, and death. Yeah, let me tell you one thing here. You see, when we say about gods, you see, it is God, Yama is again God of death. And Shurabindu speaks about the Godheads of little mind, Godheads of the lower vital. All the time he speaks about Godheads. Lord Yama is God of death. And Savitri, she is the incarnation of the Goddess Savitri. And Ashwapati is Lord of Tapasya. Again a Godhead there. So except, and then even Satyavan, we don't call him a god or a goddess, godhead, but we call him the soul of the earth. That means an avatar, an incarnation of the godhead. So these we see, all of them are God that Shravan is dealing. Ashwapati, Savitri, Lord Yama, and of course we will see other characters. So this Yama is destroyed not by Shiva here, but in this passage, not even by Savitri, then who destroys him? It is the same what Dipshiga gave you a beautiful description of Durga. Savitri takes upon herself the form of that mighty Supreme Mother, who can be called Durga. So between Shiva and Durga, we have, this, we have the semblance and the connection. So even in Savitri, it is Durga aspect which comes to destroy Yama. And uh, the beautiful passage, the two opposed each other face to face. You remark the lines, or line, the two opposed each other face to face. So it is almost to say that They are equal at present. Because when you say I am facing somebody, that means you have the strength to face that person. And he says, His being like a huge fort of darkness towered. He calls Yama the fort of darkness. And that exactly is Yama. Not Yama is the Lord, is the God of death in mythology. But Shravanda, as I told you many a time, Shravanda does not use the word Yama. He calls him night. He calls him void. He calls him darkness. He calls him all that is negation in life. And then I understood the brilliant use of the word death. Why Shravanda doesn't use Yama? Because if everything in life, that which negates what? Negates the divine. If everything that negates the divine, that is death. 
So which means we are constantly dying. Because there's so much of falsehood, there's so much of negativity, there's so much of resistance within us that we are partners. It's not so. When you say yama, it means one time death. At the end of your biological life, you are dying. But Sri Aurobindo, by using the word death, he connotes that it's not that end of this body. We are continuously dying because we are continuously negating the divine which is much more serious, much more a greater calamity than, than the last act of death itself. So Sri brings out in Savitri that opposition to life which is there continuous. So he puts it here saying that his huge fort of darkness towered. Around it her light grew an ocean siege. A while the shade survived defying heaven, assailing in front, oppressing from above, a concrete mass of conscious power, he bore the tyranny of a divine desire. I mean, it, it is not just poetry, you can see, almost visualize this Goddess Savitri, this Durga Savitri, this Supreme Mother Savitri, who has the tyranny of a divine desire, divine desire not to kill him, but to transform him. So there is a kind of a, not just a, a destruction, what we saw in the story of Mark and Shiva just beheads Yama. Here, you see that uh, description, Around it, her light grew. Around this darkness, the light of Savitri grew and he calls it an ocean siege. It is as if a huge ocean of light is coming to lay upon darkness. There is a deeper meaning to this, I'll tell you. A while the shade survived defying heaven, a pressure of intolerable force weighed on his unbowed head and stubborn breast. You see, it's not a killing. You don't see any way the question of killing. It's a pressure. A pressure of intolerable force. And again it says a concrete mass of conscious power, an ocean siege. So there's a kind of a pressure from different sides. And what happens? Light like a burning tongue licked up his thoughts. Light licked up his thoughts. So the first thing is, light destroys his thought level, the mind. And remember, this Lord of Death was brilliant mind because he represents human mind. The first thing in the, in the work of transformation is that the mindset of man has to be changed. Even before the physical can be changed, the mind has to be open, it has to go beyond its own limitations. So here also uh, confirms to that, he's saying that light, light was a luminous torture in his heart, light coursed a splendid agony through his nerves. See the words, splendid and agony. I mean, this use of, of this poetic, you know, putting them en jambe, as we say in French, putting together the opposites, it gives a peculiar sense of, you know, a meaning where it comes out saying that there is agony, torture, but there is the joy, because there's ha something is happening. What is that something happening? That question of transformation. Has Sri Aurobindo used the word only agony? It would have been the killing, the negative aspect. But here we don't want anything negative. So something positive is going to happen because death is being transformed. So there is a joy of transformation on one side and there is an agony of disappearance on the other side. So he calls it the splendid agony. 
His darkness muttered, perishing in her blaze. Her mastering word commanded every limb and left no room for his enormous will that seemed pushed out into some helpless space and could no more re-enter but left him void. So what has happened, if you can notice here, his darkness muttered, perishing in her blaze, her mastering word commanded every limb. So what has happened to death? In the story, yes, Shiva beheads Yama. But in Sri Aurobindo, there is no killing. As Sri Aurobindo's philosophy itself is a philosophy of transformation. So even death is not killed. Because what's the fun? Just try to imagine that if I can remove my death or at least postpone death, I can live 100 years, 200 years, 500 years. But I am not transformed. My nature is not transformed. I am the same old fool, the same old fool of ego, the same old sentiment, the same old passion, the same old... What is the fun of postponing death? You being what you are. So Sri says, it's not the death of Yama that's important. It's your transformation that is much more important. So we see, constantly, Yama is being transformed. And one word, her mastering word commanded every limb. Now here the mother would explain. I think in the mother, in the, in the Mahakali aspect, when Sri Aurobindo is describing the, the power of Mahakali, the destruction, the destructive power, he adds a line there. That it destroys all that, all that is negative, all that is dark, all that is, you know, that should not be there. But her destruction carries with it the great immense love. So destruction is not out of hatred. It is out of immense love for humanity, love for you, that she removes your, your darkness. Why a simple example when a patient goes to a doctor and with all the pain, you know, he may give you an injection saying it will go. The injection itself is painful. But then, you know, the doctor will remove your pain. So you not only, you thank him, at the end of the day you say, my God, you, you are my God, the way you have saved me out of my pain. So we think the same way that the Mahakali destroys out of, a, out of great love for humanity. And this is exactly what the mother would tell about Savitri, that what is that power, when you say the supreme power has transformed death, or she says it's not the power of Durga, it's the power of supreme love. So therefore, Savitri represents not only power, but the question of supreme divine love. So the entire incarnation of Savitri is nothing but an incarnation of love. And wow. therefore, he says, because it is love alone that can transform. No other power can transform. All other powers only kill. But love transforms. So mother would come to our rescue to tell us, love transforms in what way? By the manner of identification. Try to understand this. The process of transformation is to the process of identification. Love has the possibility, the capacity to identify itself with the other. And that the higher the love, the higher is the identification. And once when you know the person through identification or identity, then you know what he or she needs, what is true for him, what is good for him. And then you will not harm the person or destroy the person, but give him what he needs, what is required for him. So that is the magic of love. It identifies and it transforms. 
it never destroys and therefore here we see the transformation so what i wanted to bring out essentially as you see in the story of markandeya and in the story of shobindo this is a major difference that there in the whole old mythology and here transformation and there again is similar when i said when uh, shiva says okay let him revive come back we have a similar line in passage in savitri where savitri tells yama i hail the almighty and victorious death thou grandiose darkness of the infinite a beautiful description darkness of the infinite is not a small darkness the darkness of the infinite means it is an aspect of the infinite remember of the infinite supreme or shobhan the calls the supreme brahman it is an innate aspect of the supreme so he calls it d capital darkness of the infinite o void that makest room for all to be hunger that gnaws at the universe get the meaning hunger that gnawing you know that really gnawing words kya bolte hai that that you know you know the meaning of gnawing you know hunger that gnaws at the universe consuming the cold remnants of the sun a brilliant thing death consumes the cold remnants of the sun that means all that is dead and dying and decaying you know against the sun if the sun is not there you know everything decays so that kind of a negative thing that death takes away you know sometimes the dying man says thanks death you are coming to take away my rotten body you know that that which is decaying and troubling is the, is the yama who take or not yama the death who takes away and it is the whole world with the jaws of fire i don't know how to explain wasted of the energy that has made the stars in conscience carrier of the seeds of thought nations in which all knowledge sleeps entombed and slowly emerges in its hollow breast wearing the mind's mask of bright ignorance well that was the first one now this is what is coming important thou art my shadow and my instrument this is exactly almost you can see i don't know sanskrit but i if i can find out markandeya's lines would be similar where it says thou art my shadow and my instrument so shiva says o yama continue to be because you are needed on the earth to clean up the earth to clean up the death to clean up the suffering you are needed so shiva revives yama in that story and and savitri also says thou art my shadow and my instrument i have given thee thy awful shape of dread and thy sharp sword of terror and grief and pain to force the soul of man to struggle for light clear brilliant this is to force the soul of man to struggle for light i mean you go back to a story of yudhishthir you know where is that story kya story of that five the question that yudhishthir is asked what is the strangest thing of man is that we never think of our own death the strangest thing in this universe is that we are all going to die but we never think about it except when you are perhaps in the cancer bed even there people don't think they think yes i may die i am supposed to die so here is this the 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 existence of death is to force the soul of man to struggle for light and there she would say that this question of the a continuous journey if death were not there if we was given the same mortality frankly say would we really 
work as much as you are working. There could be yes and no. Both the possibilities are there. One possibility is people say no. I think because there is constantly the fear of death, that I know I've got, I've got maybe 80 years, 70 years, 90 years, you never know. So we think, let us do, let us go on, let us progress, let us finish the work, let us... So there is this zeal for going, moving forward because of this shadow of death. But on the other side, even if death were not there, or this end, so-called end, in fact, philosophically, death is not the end. It is only a passage into the next form. Because fundamentally what Sri Aurobindo would tell us, and of course this is there even among the Upanishadic Rishis, is that there is this eternal urge in man to progress, to move forward. We may not even think of death, but we surely work towards progress towards moving forward, towards a heightening, towards expansion, towards becoming more enlightened, because of one element, because of the psychic being. You see, some people may, may be pretty dumb, not having very good intelligence, not much of an aspiration, being tamasic. And yet, why is it that every human being born upon this earth wants to expand, wants to increase in whatever way, materially, spiritually, vitally, intellectually, but there's a question of expansion. And Sri Aurobindo in the Life Divine goes further to say, not expansion, but unification. This return to the Supreme, we have come from the Supreme, from the infinite, the finite has come, and the whole urge of the finite is to go back to the infinite. And that is simple word called evolution. We may put it in many words. But the finite wanting to become the infinite, because that is the motherhead, but it, that is the womb from where I have come. So Sri tells us, because I have been separated from that infinite womb, there is that innate sense of going back. And that going back is evolution, is progress, is expansion, is increase, whatever you want to say. So now we understand why human beings are athirst for progress. Now it depends on you what line you want to. But if you are, if you are not thirsty for progress, the opposite happens. You become static, you stagnate, you get rot, and it's out. So, in fact, there was a quotation on my table some time back. Mother would tell us an institution, if it doesn't progress, it will die. So there's only two things, either you go forward or you go backward. Movement there has to be. Because nothing can be static, stable like that. So there's a movement forward, there's a movement backward. So be it institution or an individual, you've got to move forward. Well, coming back to the line, what time is the break? Uh, what time is the break? Tell me. I have to go and Quarter to ten. ten. Quarter to ten, so I need to continue. Yeah. So it says, uh, at, on the brevity of his half conscious days, thou art his spurred to greatness in his works, the whip to his yearning for eternal bliss, his poignant need of immortality. You see all that I was explaining? One word, his poignant need of immortality. I mean, Sri gives us such brilliant uh, jewels of truths, which really carry so much of meaning. He says, to whip, the whip to his yearning for eternal bliss. All our management and everybody wanting to be happy, you know, who wants to be happy, how to be happy. And Madam Shruti Bidwakar holds a seminar on how to be happy. What is all this nonsense, how to be happy? You need not, 
try to be happy you are happiness you are seeking that eternal bliss because we have come from ananda to the earth into the suffering and you are going back to ananda so the whole journey you want it or not come from ananda lives in ananda goes back to ananda it is we on the contrary who have put impediments on experiencing ananda so it's not the question of wanting to be happy you are happy the question of how to remove these impediments that is more sure so he says uh, now is she would say live death a while be still my instrument this is exactly what shiva must have told yama all right because if you are not there there will be too many old bodies and rotten bodies in the earth better you be my instrument remove all that so yeah uh, sat uh, savitri tells the same thing live death a while that is the most important word whole of savitri if that word were not there i would shut the book it has no meaning imagine the whole book hangs on one word live death a while got the meaning nahi <laughs> she savitri is telling to death you stay on for a little more for some more centuries for some more year not um, some more maybe thousands of years or another 5000 or 10000 if you don't use the word a while the two things that are happening live death be still my instrument that is how long will it live if it is there for eternity then what is the use of savitri savitri is wanting immortality so savitri is telling i have conquered i have transformed you you are no more needed but until humanity comes to the level of the supramental consciousness you are required so that a while is the time period required for our evolution so he says continue to be for a while is till the time that is required what is the time evolution will tell us one day man too shall know thy fathomless heart of silence and the brooding peace of night and grave obedience to eternal law and the calm inflexible pity in thy gaze beautiful i mean you fall in love with death you know you know in uh, in hindi there's a bit of a pun on that that somebody says i love death because wo aati hai maut aati hai you know the, the poets who make fun maybe in english you wouldn't know aati means the death is coming aata aati is a feminine aata is a masculine so death being a feminine person he says i love because you know a lady is coming to you love that's what the man is thinking so he says i love be- death because that lady death is coming to me there's a bit of a pun there but here the question is one day man too shall know thy fathomless heart now you see man too again the word you see every little word you have got to you know put your ears to that why is savitri or shravan the telling that one day man too shall know ab to mam i know it now i have known your truth but after a while after some years after some centuries even man will know what that thy fathomless heart the death you have a fathomless heart what full of pity because at that time this black mask of death would be gone and we'll see after all death is also it, it has love for mankind so man too shall know of silence and brooding peace of night and grave obedience to eternal law he said death is grave obedience absolute obedience to eternal law l capital so if there is anything anyone who follows in fact his sanskrit called yama dharma raja 
Yama is one who follows the law of dharma. That's what Sri Ramanda calls it, obedience to eternal law. So you see in India we have caught this truth so much, we call him Yama Dharma Raja, Yama one who follows the eternal law, dharma. So he says, but now O timeless mightiness, stand aside. You see, Savitri never insults death, you must have seen in all the dialogue, Savitri never insults death. He, she calls him a void, he, she calls him victorious death, she calls him and he says, O oh, timeless mightiness, stand aside and leave the path of my incarnate force. Who is that incarnate force? Satyavan. He says, because he is gripping Satyavan, he has caught hold of Satyavan, he says, leave him alone. He, now, leave him alone. Relieve the radiant God from thy black mask. So Satyavan also is called God here. So Satyavan is God, Savitri is God, Yama is God, Ashwapati is God. And there are all the levels of God here in the, in the light mind, what is that, higher mind, lower mind. So in a way the whole of Savitri is nothing but gods and goddesses. Put in a kind of modern terminology, modern context. And so he says, uh, Freed from thy clutch of pain and ignorance, that he may stand master of life and fate, man's representative in the house of God, the mate of wisdom and the spouse of light, the eternal bridegroom and the eternal bride. So that is the mask of death. So I found such a similarity, so close between the story of Markandeya and our own Savitri. And yet, there's the element of transformation. What Markandeya has envisioned, the way he told us the story or about his own life, we have a difference. Now coming back to what I was telling was uh, about the gods. Uh, yeah, I think that's the first part I wanted to tell you about the definition of gods. The question of the story of Mark and Day and our and uh, the passages in death in, from Savitri. Now I'll take it to another level or another section, which is very interesting. All of you know the very first sentence of Savitri. Who doesn't know? I'm sure every one of you knows. Well, Deborah may be doubtful. Anybody? Would you tell me? You don't know. It was the hour before God's It was the hour? Before the God's Awake. God says G cap or G small? Huh? Cap. Apostrophe S or with our plural? Plural. So that's the, because a lot of people make mistakes there. So the funniest part is Savitri begins with gods. What are you talking about trying to discover gods and goddesses? Look at Sri starts the whole of Savitri, the first sentence is, it was the hour before the gods awake. G, G cap. So there you can put it down and say, my God, Savitri is nothing, nothing but a book of gods. Nothing but the Vedas, nothing but the Vedanta. But then he has made it very difficult for us to understand that when did the gods sleep that they are going to get a, be awake? You see, before the gods awake. So we start getting into trouble. Somebody is there. Yes, 
So then the whole discussion comes in, the scholars come in and they say, yeah, when did they sleep and, you know, then there are parallelisms saying that in Indian temple, you know, gods are woken up at, the, at four o'clock, the Brahma Murtam and then otherwise throughout the night they sleep and then four o'clock you put the ganti and, and then all our Indian temples, you know, you wake up the gods. So some people said, is it that God is woken up? But Shravad is not speaking about the gods in the temples. He said, it was the hour before the gods awake. What is that hour? 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5.30 p.m.? Or was it really the hour means the specific hour of the time? Or maybe there was no time at all, there was no hour to count by. So the very first thing when, we, when I chose about these topics, I said, the very first line is about gods. And the whole of this Canto 1, most of it, is only a description of the first line. He is himself explaining, which we never realize. So all of us great scholars, with great bald heads, all of us we have, we try to see, hey, what is this God's awake? And foolish are we to see that whole of Canto 1 is nothing but Shravamita himself explains what is that hour and who are those gods? How did they wake up? Who woke them up? So he calls it, across the path of the divine event, the huge foreboding mind of night, alone in her unlit temple of eternity, lay stretched immobile upon silence march. So, he starts describing. And then this line, it was the hour before the gods awake, as I told you, a lot of the pundits of, of English language and poetry. They suggested to Shorabindo that why don't you change this first line, it's very tricky, mystic and you know. Shorabindo said, of course, you know, this first canto was revised 13 times. And the first line remained the first line forever. Of course, uh, it was almost uh, most of the scripts, uh, drafts is like that. He told this, uh, this scholar saying, even if you were to give me the earnings of Kavi Samrat, I'll not change this line, its position or its words. You know what's the meaning of Kavi Samrat? You know, in India we used to have a tradition of each of these kings would have a great kavi, a poet. And he would be the best poet and he would earn the greatest amount of money, rewards and all that. So the earnings of a kavi samarat would be very huge in those times, you know. So Shravanda said, even if you were to give me the earnings of a kavi samarat, I will not change this line. You can imagine the importance of this line. I mean, it must have been a line straight from the overmental level. You know, it, in its mantric effect, in its symbolism, in its everything. Well, I'm not going to get into the uh, f first canto, although I'm very much getting tempted to take it up, but you know, that will lead me to another thing. That's the first line. Now what happens after that? Uh, after this first line, for about, till about first, first page is what, uh, till page six, he describes only this first line in different way, ways. And then in the middle of this canto, he takes up, suddenly he brings in Savitri. It's a real dramatic effect, you know. On one side he's thinking about that, about that, the great event across the, across the, 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 across the path of the divine event. And suddenly he speaks of Savitri and he says, 
Savitri too awoke among these tribes that hastened to join the brilliant summoner's chant. See the, see the contrast. One is speaking of the eternity and the other is speaking of the mortal world about Savitri. So that is why it is called, Savitri is called a dramatic epic. It is epic in its essence because it starts at the peak of the story of any epic story. Well, that is, you know, you can go on speaking a lot about that, but, you know, I'm supposed to be speaking on gods and goddesses. So that is the first line. Now from here, we have to go to the second part. <clears throat> 